Good afternoon. Um, as she said, my name is Jerry Lynn Johnson. I'm the founder and music director of the Black Pearl Chamber Orchestra. Please do not be alarmed. This is not a lesson in uh, psychology 101. I am going to make a few points and actually loop back to something Melissa Gilbert talked about with genius. I also have another announcement to make. Sadly, I did not win the lottery. Uh, so, uh, with that said, I actually like to just start uh, with just a couple things about Freud's theory of personality. He says that it's composed of three elements, the id, the ego, and the superego. I'm sure we've heard these terms before. They work together to create complex human behaviors. The first, the one that we are born with, is the id, or Latin translated into it. It's entirely unconscious, includes our instinctive and primitive behaviors. It's driven by what we all famously know uh, from Janet Jackson, the pleasure principle. It contains the passions and it is a source of all psychic energy, making it the primary component of our personality. The ego, which develops a little bit later, is developed from the id and ensures that the impulses of the id are expressed in a manner acceptable in the real world. In other words, if we're hungry, we can't just go up to someone and just steal their food right out of their hands. People probably wouldn't take too kindly to that. So the ego is the thing that kind of manages the id's impulses in the real world. Uh, finally, we have the superego, Latin, which literally means it's over the ego, it's over the I, it's the last component of personality, according to Freud, to develop. It holds all of our kind of internalized moral standards about what we should do, what we ought to do, and it also functions um, in an interesting way to actually ask the ego to act upon idealistic standards, not just the reality that's placed in front of us. Um, Jung, who was a, a famously a protege, a pro, excuse me, protege of Freud, and then later um, kind of di diverged from his ideas, came up with something called, um, which is later developed, called the persona. Now, the Latin term for persona it comes from pair through sound and sona, per uh, through and sona sound, and it's derived from uh, the Greek and Latin masks that were used on stage. Uh, the actors would put masks on, and the sound of their voices would be projected through the mask, and that was how they portrayed certain characters on the stage. So according to Carl Jung, the persona was this mask that we use in social situations, on the one hand to make an impression upon people, and on the other to actually true, to conceal our true natures. Um, so it's this social kind of interaction that we present to people that we say, oh, uh, I'm so-and-so, but it actually is concealing our true natures. And, and we have kind of, I think, an inherent understanding of what these personae are in social situations. For example, you're at a cocktail party, you make the introductions, hi, my name is so-and-so, oh, you're Mark's friend, oh, I, I heard about you from so-and-so, well, what do you do? And the very common say, oh, I'm a lawyer, you know, I'm a teacher, I'm a marketing consultant. I just made these up. I picked this up off the internet. I just figured these were pictures. I would just make up whatever they're, you know. Or I'm a vet, easy. I'm a veterinarian. Or I'm a conductor. We go to cocktail parties and say this to people, and the reaction was a mixture of surprise and disbelief. Because when I said I'm a conductor, I mean, I'm a conductor. This is what they think. <laughs> And so they would say, you, you, you drive a train? And I would say, well, no, d d does this look like it? You know, maybe in there, or this, I don't know. But, you know, whatever it was, this, this is not what they were thinking. And, and it, you know, at, at first it became uh, kind of comic. Uh, and then it became rather disturbing, and, and you know, you'll hear about that why. We've had some of the speakers who've come up here talked about their crossroads moments, and uh, I'm going to tell you the story of mine in a moment. Um, but you know, basically, everybody thinks of conductors. They're these charismatic leaders who are very imposing and striking fear and terror into the hearts of people. These are some pictures of famous composers, very kind of stern taskmasters, and one of the worst. Of course, you know, you have this kind of maestro uh, uh, personality of Arturo Toscanini, who is very famous for being incredibly abusive to the musicians. He would call them names, make them cry. He would throw his score at them in, in, uh, during rehearsal. This is, I love this picture. We can just see him just flailing his arms, you know, just screaming at the orchestra. And so people, you know, and, and, and conductors and the maestros regarded this as this sort of Svengali who, you know, through a combination of, you know, uh, fear and, well, Ricardo Muti's sex appeal, frankly. 
people still talk about, oh, Muti, you know, how sexy he was. You know, so we have these magical powers of terror and sex appeal where we kind of, you know, are, are using this charisma to kind of cajole and, and coax the musicians and dominate them and also kind of sway the audience as well. And, you know, it's very important, again, as we can't forget the hair. This is also extremely important. And so all of these qualities kind of go into creating what we call the maestro. And this is, I love this cartoon, again, I found on the internet. But it kind of combines all of these stereotypes of the very kind of stern, arrogant, you can see you've got a full head of hair, you know, this kind of attitude of, oh, look at me. And so this, this maestro persona has become almost like an icon in leadership. You have a lot of, if you just go, again, a cursory look through the internet, you'll find a lot of leadership gurus kind of using the maestro and, and conducting an orchestra almost as a way to sort of uh, talk about how do you team build, how do you communicate effectively, um, you know, demonstrating these real-time leadership skills. Uh, some conductors themselves have even created uh, conducting workshops to teach corporate leaders some leadership skills. Um, there's a really great book that um, Thomas Rogelski and, and Terry Gates wrote called Music Education for Changing Times, Guiding Visions for Practice. And they say the orchestra with this conductor have long been interpreted as a representation of even, or I even idealization of the smooth running capitalist organizational structure. Relatively recently, management guru Peter Drucker in 2001 used the conductor as his model for his, for his authoritarian new CEO whose job as a corporate leader is to directly and insistently focus each player's skill and knowledge on the ensemble's joint performance. Um, similarly to this, very interestingly enough, uh, not just in a corporate situation, but, but almost a, a, a political uh, situation, Maestro has become this uh, model of political leadership. And there's another great TEDx contributor, Ben Zander, who is the founder of the Boston Philharmonic Orchestra. He's been quoted as saying, you know, that the conductor is, is, as he says, the last bastion of totalitarianism in the world, the one person whose authority never gets questioned. He says there's a saying, every dictator aspires to be a conductor. Um, and, and so there's this, this also where, you know, we kind of, you know, relish in this, you know, free kind of will and free power of these, you know, maestros kind of lording it over the musicians. There's, there's a very dark side of this where, you know, people recognize how very anti-democratic this is. And, and this feeling, to me at least, of having the passion and creativity stifled and punished at work for the musicians is part of this, this kind of almost, uh, likely this very kind of visible link to the great conductor like Brahms and, and Wagner and Beethoven certainly as one of the cr truly mythic you know, figures. And here he is himself conducting. You can see his hair is flailing. He's passionate. He's got a furrowed brown. He's raising his arms up. And you can see you know, great conductors, you know, they, they almost want to look like, like Beethoven. You've got this grizzled expression of the lines and furrows of genius and concentration in your face. And you know, here's Karyon with his arms stretched out for inspiration you know, from the great masters. And so you have all of these kind of things that go into this maestro persona that people buy into. And so, you know, I, it, it was funny to me that when I said, oh, I'm a conductor, people, again, assumed, oh, it was for a septa or something like that. They weren't assuming that I was an orchestra conductor. And, and in fact, it became humorous up until 2005. And here's my crossword story. Um, there's a great uh, woman conductor, Marin Alsop. She's now the music director of the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra. She became the first woman to really lead one of the major American orchestras like that. R really broke an important glass ceiling. She started something to help and mentor other kind of the, the younger generation of women conductors called the Taki Concordia Conducting Fellowship. And through this, it was giving uh, young women conductors greater opportunities and visibility to conduct world famous uh, orchestras and, and really get them to the next professional level. Because she recognized really how difficult it was to kind of break through this stereotype in this particular profession. So in 2005, I won this fellowship and, and that made me the first African American woman to win an international conducting prize and fellowship. And so I'm thinking, wow, I'm hot stuff now. You know, I'm going to go out on the job trail. I'm going to take job auditions as a conductor. Orchestras are going to fall all over themselves trying to get to me because I've won this award and I've got all this experience and everything. So I go to California and I, 
I take a, you know, conductors, uh, it's not like auditioning, you know, as a violinist for an orchestra. That's all behind a screen. So you have the, the musicians sitting here on the chair. There's a screen in front. They're performing. The, the people uh, running the audition can't see the person sitting in the chair. When you're a conductor, obviously your whole job is about nonverbal communication and visibility. And so your audition and your job audition is in front of basically the entire orchestra, the board, the audience, all these things. So uh, hundreds of people apply for conducting jobs. There's very few of them. There's only one of them in the whole, in the whole orchestra. So I beat out hundreds of candidates to get down to the last 10, get down to the last three. I'm one of the last three, and I don't get the job. This happens repeatedly. The last time I did this, um, the search committee was very nice. They actually returned my phone call, which they don't always do. Um, and I said, thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't get the job, but, but you know, it would be helpful for me next time. Can you please you know, tell me what I did right, tell me what I did wrong, so that when I go on the next one, I can go in even better prepared. And the gentleman on the phone was very nice and very polite and a little scared. And he said, well, the board thought your ideas were great. The orchestra loved your conducting. We thought it would be really fun to work with you. We just didn't know how to market you. Well, I'm thinking to myself, OK, you get some three sheets. You hire a photographer. I don't know. You put some commercials. Like, what do you mean? You don't, so I, well, can you, what does that mean? You don't know how to market me. And he kind of swallowed on the phone. And he said, um, we just don't think our audience would understand that you were the conductor. At which point, I now understood what he meant. Um, that was an, an important uh, moment in my life. Painful, but necessary, and probably one of the best things to ever happen to me. Um, I have to say I was stunned at the reality. Um, orchestras, as we know, are facing a, a lot of difficulties. Um, the Philadelphia Orchestra, as we all know, recently declared bankruptcy, and, and their, their wonderful board chairman, Dick Worley, in, a, in an interview for the, for the Philadelphia Inquirer said, look, uh, tickets haven't been selling, basically. Uh, ticket sales and our audience uh, have just dropped off. I think he said between um, the last five years, well, over the last 20 years, I think he said, that their ticket, their audience and ticket sales had dropped from 250,000 to 150,000, and that almost half of that had happened over the last five years, which is surprising. Um, and, and to me, a lot of that comes down from this maestro myth that we have here, this image of leadership, this dictatorial commanding presence that actually punishes creativity from the musicians. Conductors, typically, these maestros, Arturo Toscanini, all of these great conductors were legendary for basically suppressing the orchestra. That was the ideal leadership style, was we are garnering this orchestra, we're commanding and controlling, we're getting them, we're bending them to our will. I had this divine right to lead the orchestra because I had this physical similarity to the great conductors, I had this spiritual affinity with them, and you will follow my leadership. Unquestioning obedience, your input is not necessary. It it is disregarded, please don't offer it, it will be punished. That has been the leadership style. In, in, in an industry that you would think making music would be, you know, kind of passion and creativity would be kind of our working tools, almost like a computer and an internet connection. So it's, it's almost this, this strange kind of command and control aesthetic that has gone on in symphony orchestras. And the, the sad thing is that that command and control aesthetic actually has been passed into the audience as well. If you look at uh, a lot of orchestra websites, they're, they're so aware of the fact that they have this perception of, you know, it's this kind of elitist mentality and only very special people can enjoy it. And you have to be an, an aficionado to really understand classical music and you should really sit properly in your chair to understand. They actually have whole pages on their websites that start off saying, feeling like you don't belong here, feeling like you don't know if you should be coming to this concert, but we'll give you concert etiquette to get you through this. And they have whole pages designed to basically control your concert experience for you. Here's when you should clap. If you don't know, don't. Just look around and see if everyone else is clapping, and then you'll know whether or not you should clap. Here's how you should dress if you come to our concert. If you have to cough, please suppress it. 
for the experience because this will help you have a better concert experience and everyone around you. And so it was just amazing to me that in this atmosphere where classical music orchestras, and this has been going on for 20 years or so, have been having these declining ticket sales, their audience is dropping off, the audience is not diverse, they can't attract newcomers, they can't re-engage music lovers, why would they not want to try something new? Why would they not want to think outside of the box? And the second reason this stunned me, quite frankly, is I couldn't believe this was 2006 and someone was telling me, excuse me, you're a black woman, you can't have this job. Really? Who says that anymore and doesn't expect to get sued? I, it's, it was just phenomenal to me. And so this was my crossroads moment. I realized that no one was really going to ever see me as a quote unquote maestro because I didn't physically resemble that. So this mask, this persona of the maestro, that was not going to be realistic for me. And so I had what I call a wake up call. What Jung would call this is really a breakdown of the persona. So, oops, I got a little ahead of myself. He calls this a breakdown of the persona. And basically, in, in Jung's world, you have this mask, this social identity that's out there. This is how you negotiate with the world, but it's, con it's concealing your true identity. And what these people told me was, listen, you're going to have to find a real way to convince people that you're a conductor and make that maestro persona your own. And so what I did is I realized I was going to have to use my own true identity as a leader to break through this, this stereotype. And so what I realized is that not only did I have a, a connection to the great you know, conductors myself, I mean, these are pictures of me side by, that's Leonard Bernstein on, on the top, and that's, you know, basically we've got our hair going, as you can see, and that one. You know, I can be just as forceful and dynamic as these people, but that I was gonna use my reality as an African-American woman, young, passionate, wanting to engage people, and I was going to transform that maestro persona into something that was more authentic for me. So what I realized in the breakdown of my persona, I know, I'm going to get to this picture in a moment, is that my identity was the key to authenticity and leadership. These people infuriated me to the point where I realized if they can't think outside the box, then I'm going to be outside the box. And that being outside the box afforded me greater power, freedom, and opportunity for creativity and expression than merely thinking outside the box. That's what I mean by they did me a favor by making me mad. So when I let that genie out of the bottle, something magical happened. And let me tell you what a genie is. Now, it was interesting that Melissa, I'm sorry, Melinda Gilbert talked about genius. And she's correct. As you can see, genius comes from, um, it's, a, it's a Latin word, as she said, this kind of tutelary deity. But if you go backwards to what a jinn is and the meaning of the etymology of the word jinn, it's fascinating that, that this jinn um, comes from the Arabic root a jnn or jnen meaning to hide or to be hidden. In other words, derived from this root are majnun, which means mad, and janin, which means an embryo or fetus or something hidden inside the womb. And that there's a word for garden or paradise called jenna, which is a cognate of a Hebrew word, garden, derived from the same Semitic root. And, and these cultures have another word for paridaisa, which is an Avestan word, and an Avestan language is, is a, a special spiritual language in Zoroastrian scripture that's only used for Zoroastrian scripture. That means a garden hidden behind walls. So this genie is this deity that comes from something hidden deep inside. It's related to madness. And when you put these things side by side with genius and Freud's id, they have a unique similarity. So something concealed or hidden, there's madness. It's hidden beside it, inside us from birth. Just like Freud's id, it's entirely unconscious. It's, it's the only component of our personality that's present from birth. We have this beautiful pleasure principle, like this garden paradise that's hidden behind the walls that contains our passions. There's an amazing similarity here. So when I say I tapped into my identity as an African-American woman, what I mean is I tapped into my id entity, my entity from my id, which is my genius. And that's something that's present in all of us, that ability to tap into that voice inside us. So I kind of disagree with Melinda Gilbert. I don't think it's some special creative little person that's from outside of us that's mysterious. I think it's the personification of that voice deep down inside of us that wants to get out and express itself from behind those walls.
So I tapped into my identity, and where those maestros would be dictatorial, I would be inviting to the musicians. Where those conductors would say, no, I am the sole arbiter of creativity and passion, I would say, no, I want you to add your creativity and passion to this process, because I am not a maestro, I am a conductor in every sense of the word. Not only do I lead and guide, I also serve as a vessel. What do I serve as a vessel for? I serve as a vessel for that passion, that creativity and energy to be passed out like a leap and a spark between each musician, so that each musician on the stage then is encouraged to tap into their own excuse me, passion and creativity. And together, we are gonna create a charged atmosphere whereby that spark that we've ignited then leaps into the audience and invites them to tap into their creativity and passion as well. Because for me, being a leader wasn't about creating a happy experience for followers. It was about creating opportunities for them to become leaders themselves. And that was what I meant by when I became a maestro and, and created, recreated that maestro myth in my own image, that was really what I meant. That was the opportunity that these people gave me, and without which I would not be standing here in front of you today. Thank you very much. Thank you.